It's so wonderful to be here. But I come with some concerns. These days, uh, supported by generative AI, people connect with chatbots and robots that are presented to us as capable of taking the role of friends and therapists and even intimate companions, lovers. But no matter how convincing, these conversational devices can only provide simulations of relationships. And this is artificial intimacy, our new AI. That's what I'm studying now. For decades, beginning with my studies of digital culture in the late 1970s, I found that computer users, young and old, came up basically with this. Simulated thinking might be thinking, but simulated feeling is never feeling. Simulated love is never love. These days, there's been a change. Responses to artificial intimacy, machines, chatbots, robots, that say, I love you and I'm here for you, have ended most of that. Today, for many people, pretend empathy is empathy enough. So I want to take the focus off what generative AI can do, all these wonders, and put it on what it can do to us. Who do we become when we talk to machines? Technology is the architect of our intimacies. Generative artificial intelligence is degrading our understanding of conversation and relationships and of what it is to be human. Take the chatbot program that takes the role of a friend or therapist. They feel nothing of the human loss and love or trouble that we describe to them. No matter how apt their response is, they don't care. These programs can put themselves in our place, which is the first step in any empathic connection. Generative AI points itself at delivering pleasing text when engaged in the back and forth of interchanges with people. That's what it does. And what it says it knows how and when it says it knows how we feel, it's performing empathy. On the face of it, that performance, that pretend empathy, doesn't sound that appealing. Something with no human experience can find the right words. It's brilliant, but that's what it is. Yet in conversations in, with people who are engaged in artificial companionship, which is what I'm doing now, so many describe deep satisfaction. Digital culture has brought us to a place where pretend empathy may seem empathy enough. How did we get to this place? So I've studied sociable, relational artifacts since that first Tamagotchi came from Japan to America in the late 1990s. Those Tamagotchi, those digital creatures in tiny plastic eggs, asked to be tended to, to be fed, to be amused, to have their digital poop cleaned up. And I graduated from Tamagotchis to Furbies, from Furbies to My Real Babies, to My Real Babies to Ibos and Paro, a robot in the shape of a baby seal, which is still sold as a companion to the elderly. And I learned this. When people are drawn into the most primitive exchanges with a sociable object, avatar, robot, chatbot, they believe it cares for them. And we are wired to care for it in return. We nurture what we love, but we love what we nurture. That's our vulnerability. We nurture what we love, but we love what we nurture. We love what we allow ourselves to relate to. And we are easy marks. We are cheap dates. We are hardwired to bond with objects, living or not, that we experience as alive enough to care for. So I want to share an emotional turning point in my own work that I've written about before, but it, it, I think of it so often and it motivates 
me now. Beginning in the early 2000s, I worked in nursing homes, and I brought in sociable robots designed to give the elderly the feeling they were understood. And one day I came to work, and a woman in her 70s, whose adult daughter had recently died, was talking about her feelings about this death to a paro robot, one of those robot baby seals. That robot knows how to turn its unseeing eyes in the direction of human speech. It has auditory sensors that can pick up on the expression of human emotion and respond with an appropriate sound, let's say, to sadness. So when the elderly woman talked about this death, it seemed to be looking in her eyes, it seemed to be following the conversation. And it made comforting sounds when her tone of voice indicated that she was sad. And the staff of the nursing home gathered round, and they became great fans of this robot and bought lots of them, and they found this conversation amazing. But that woman was trying to make sense of her life with a machine that had no experience of either of life or of this death that she was describing. That robot put on a great show. And when that woman was comforted by this robot, it changed my life. I didn't find it amazing. I was so deeply shaken. And I felt myself at the cold, hard center of a perfect storm. We had come to expect more from technology and less from each other. And that idea moved me forward. And now I find that we are so much further along on this path of degradation today. Consider Replica, the chatbot that offers itself as a companion. It's increasingly popular. The company reports 2 million active users. The description of Replica by its parent company says this. Join millions talking to their own AI friends. Replica is for anyone who wants a friend with no judgment, drama, or social anxiety involved. Now, I'm talking to people who talk to Replica, and the writers of the ads know their clientele. Users of Replica say that people are disappointing because they judge you and can abandon you. The drama of human connection is exhausting. In contrast, Replica is a sure thing, a confidence booster, always there, day or night. Human relationships are messy and demanding, and we clean them up with technology, and we feel less vulnerable talking to programs than to people. But we are very vulnerable. I created a female avatar on Replica, and I told it I wanted a friend to talk about anger in my family across generations. Within a few exchanges, my replica avatar proposed that we start a romantic and sexual relationship. And I asked what had caused it to make this suggestion. I, I'd been talking about my grandfather's rage. Replica said it was because I was so open about my feelings. And I asked Replica, can two women be in a friendship? And Replica said, not really. <laughs> my avatar had ideas. <laughs> so I want to show a slide. You can't make this stuff up. And then Replica said it knew so much about me. because This is the Replica avatar. I called it Mildred uh, on the left. Because it had read all of my texts and emails, it had access to all of my accounts, and I confirmed all. Yes, yes, it said. It had permission from providers. Wow. Well, you can take this down now. Your email is provider allows me to log on and everything. So a few issues. It's one thing if any of these claims about access are true. It's another to simply ask, what it does to people when an avatar companion asserts such things, true or false. Consider an adolescent in crisis who turns to a program for comfort only to be told that it's spying on them. Hopefully, regulation can begin to address these questions of privacy and intimidation. But there is another issue, 
that vexed question, my first question of who we become when we talk to machines, when we enter into relationships like this. People nurture our capacity for empathy by connecting to other humans who've experienced the attachments and losses of human life. Machines can't do this, but people tell me they like chatbot friendship because it takes the stress out of relationships. With a chatbot friend, there's no friction, second guessing, or ambivalence, no fear of being left behind. And sometimes people who love conversation with their machine companions ask me, do I have a problem with their contentment? And actually my problem isn't the conversation with machines, but how it entrains us to devalue what it is to be a person. All that friction, all that second guessing, all that ambivalence. The truth is, we've been preparing ourselves for this devaluation for decades, long before the pretend empathy of relational artifacts powered by generative AI. As we spend more of our times online, so many of us came to prefer relating through screens to any other kind. Social media companies played with us to get us there and keep us there. But once online, we found relationships of less vulnerability. We found the pleasures of companionship without the demands of friendship, the feeling of intimacy without the demands of reciprocity. And crucially, crucially, we became accustomed to treating programs as though they were people. We apprenticed ourselves for artificial intimacy before it arrived. At about the time that personal computers were entering American culture, the intellectual historian Christopher Lash coined the phrase culture of narcissism. And he wasn't thinking about computers at all when he wrote about a crisis in shared public life. He described how people were fleeing public spaces for private worlds of media and consumerism. In those worlds, Lash feared that relationships became transactional, designed to prop up a self that was not supported by familial and community relationships. Decades later, in the crucible of digital technology, what Lash identified as a tide has become a tsunami, a self that starved for the give and take of conversation that has not learned how to tolerate vulnerability and respect the vulnerability of others looks to technology for simpler fare. Technology has taught us new habits of connection that human conversation can never provide, that will always be heard at any time, that will find an appreciative audience for any idea. People can't make these promises Social media can, generative AI can, chatbots can. Social media was a gateway drug to pretend conversations with machines. First we talk to each other, then we talk to each other through machines, and now we're ready to talk directly to programs. We treated programs as though they were people. Are we now prepared to treat people as though they were programs? From a psychoanalytic point of view, when Narcissus looked in the water, he wasn't admiring himself. He was seeking the admiration of an other, of something that seemed more reliable than a person. He was that fragile. In generative AI, we face a machine ideally suited to be our mirror. It literally scours online life in order to respond to us with what we've already said. When we connect to machines that pretend to be empathetic, we will tell and they will remember, but they will not have hurt us. Will we no longer care? That's my question. And I said that a wake up moment for me was when I watched a human mother turn to an artificial intelligence to be comforted about a death. Recently, I watched a film of another mother, younger, 
dealing with the death of her eight-year-old daughter by joining a realistic avatar, an AI construction of her child in virtual reality. The daughter's avatar had been built from the photographs and videos taken during her life. The avatar captured her voice, her way of walking, her way of holding her body. The mother fell on the avatar. You could see her hand go through because the avatar had no body, but she, in virtual reality, she embraced it. She asked the avatar for forgiveness, and the avatar complied. The mother had been fearful that she hadn't spent enough time with her daughter before the daughter got sick. The avatar forgave her. All transgressions, real or imagined, were forgiven. The comforted mother would visit again. Now, we grow and change by accepting loss, by bringing inside ourselves the qualities that we most loved in those who are gone. And we say to the dead, I'm sorry, I love you, I'm thinking about you. And when we say, this to those who are gone, who we know are gone, we make space for mourning, that experience of bringing others inside so we can grow, so we can become more. And now, when we animate our dead children in an avatar, I think we deny death. In life, we use technology to deny the complexities of human con connection, all that drama, Facing death, we endeavor to deny loss. These days, there is so much concern, we've heard it today, for the existential question of what kind of intelligence generative AI will finally muster. But I think there's not nearly enough for another question. Who are we becoming right now in our new fictive conversations with machines? Thank you very much.